Marxism has often betrayed a certain embarrassment uh, with the notion of morality, um, assuming, for example, that it's individualist or that it's idealist or unhistorical or just that it's plain ideology, um, to the point where certain Marxists uh, more or less use the words morality and moralism as though they, they mean the same thing. Um, they don't, of course, mean the same thing. Moralism, I suppose, means a kind of moral language which has come unstuck from political and historical questions, which really substitutes itself for those questions. Uh, and that, of course, certainly is an ideological move. Um, against that, against moralism, Marxists have rightly insisted that uh, moral values have to be looked at in their concrete social, political, and historical context. But, ironically, and unbeknown, I think, to many Marxists, um, that's exactly what traditional moralists have insisted as well. They haven't been moralizers either. You don't have to remind Aristotle, or for that matter Aquinas, a long ancient tradition of moral thought, long before Marxism, you don't have to remind them that morality is concerned with the whole life context of men and women rather than with some abstract discourse of right and wrong. To that extent, I would want to argue that Marxism is the modern day inheritor of an ancient and classical tradition of moral thought as against a modern bourgeois notion of moral thought that really often does come down to moralism. But in that sense, as in many other sense, to be a Marxist is, of course, to be a traditionalist, as indeed uh, Trotsky himself once said. What morality means to most people today, uh, sex, I suppose, first of all, or if not sex, then something uh, interpersonal, um, and something which is almost certainly a matter of prohibitions. Morality isn't very pleasant on the whole. All of that, historically speaking, so ingrained into our thought today, is a thoroughly recent historical development. Cutting a few corners, roughly speaking, it dates from early bourgeois Europe. It dates from the thought of the great bourgeois philosopher, Immanuel Kant. But the idea that morality is mainly about private or personal matters, or that it's mainly about some heavy-handed law, about pro prohibitions and so on, would have come as a mighty surprise to a long tradition of ancient and classical moral thinkers who didn't believe that morality was primarily about what we ought to do, which is a very strong modern emphasis, morality is about duty in this way of thinking, uh, but actually believed uh, it was about the development of the human personality in a concrete historical context, which was what Aristotle basically held and which was what Karl Marx held too. Marx then, I'd argue, actually, whether he knows it or not, uh, and he doesn't mention it very much, is in a long classical tradition of moral thought from Aristotle onwards. There is a problem about that, a famous problem in Marxist ethics, which is, did Marx believe in moral concepts or didn't he? Uh, a notably thorny matter. You can summon evidence either way. There's a lot in Marx which simply trashes morality as moralism, which, as I've argued, is a mistake. There are far more interesting ideas of morality than that. On the other hand, clearly, it's hard to match the zealous moral indignation and passion which goes into Marx's own writings about capitalism. So there seems to be something of a contradiction. On the one hand, Marx can be found denying at one point that the wage relation is unjust, apparently seeing justice as a bourgeois notion. On the other hand, he talks about the wage relation as actual theft, as another place, so either he didn't believe that theft was unjust, which seems a bit weird, or he was just confused. Um, did Marx believe in concepts like justice and other associated moral ideas, or didn't he? Very hard to tell. I'm attracted to the solution that Norman Garris has given, which is that Marx did indeed believe in moral concepts, but he didn't know that he did. 
gets it neatly both ways. The reason he didn't know that he did is a very interesting one. He didn't know that he did because he too uncritically accepted the moralistic notion of morality. He too assumed, not always, but on crucial occasions, that morality was simply a bourgeois ideological discourse. What he didn't then see, astonishingly, is that what he was doing in the analysis of capital or exploitation or the bourgeois state was in the most classical sense of the word, as I've been trying to argue, a moral project. It has a long lineage going right back to say, um, as Marx tends to, to hand, as it were, the concept of morality over to the bourgeoisie and say, well, we're doing something different, we're doing political or historical analysis, that precisely means that you don't take the chance of arguing that what we are doing is in a very radical and traditional sense of the word moral analysis, which is not, of course, to say it's not political, social, historical as well. It wouldn't make any sense for a classical thinker like Aristotle to try to examine what he calls individual virtue outside the polis, outside the political society, because men and women simply are political animals, and therefore their virtues and vices, their moral life, is as thoroughly political as anything. There couldn't, by definition, be, for Aristotle or a whole range of ancient thinkers, a non-political virtue. It's only in the epoch of modernity that a gap opens up between individual and society, therefore between ethics on the one hand and politics on the other. Marxism is or should be a way of trying to overcome that. I said that the, moral, the modern bourgeois notion of morality goes on too much about duty, about ought, about rights. A more traditional idea of morality, the one I'm talking about, the one I think Marxism is in line with, really sees morality as about enjoying yourself. Um, that's the tradition to which Marxists basically subscribe. It's a much more pleasant uh, idea of morality altogether. Um, Marx is, that's also there in Aristotle. Marx is, broadly speaking, although I think this may be a bit controversial, but I think he is, broadly speaking, he's an Aristotelian for, for whom the end of human life is happiness, for whom the nature of humanity is political, and for whom, therefore, happiness must be inseparably a political and an individual project. Nobody is in any doubt, surely, I mean, to address the most fundamental moral issues about what it is that everybody wants, what it is that all men and women want. No doubt about that at all. What everybody is after is happiness. And as Aristotle realized, there's no answer to the question, why are they after that? As Marx would say, the early Marx, it's part of our species being. It's actually built into us. There's no need to try to rationalize or justify in some metaphysical or philosophical sense why people want to be happy. But because happiness is an extremely complex and problematical notion and because human beings are desperately opaque to themselves and very often don't know what they desire and what it is to be happy, we need a special kind of inquiry, a special kind of language, call it if you like moral or politico moral, whatever, which actually tries to sort out first what the concept of happiness consists in for a whole society and secondly how it is materially to be achieved. Those are classic moral preoccupations, right? Nothing newfangled about those at all. Under what sort of material conditions could everybody achieve fulfillment is the classical moral question which Marxism addresses in the modern age. But the phrase, enjoy yourself, is a bit too vague, I'm afraid. It lets in too much. It, for example, lets in bourgeois hedonism. Don't forget that the people that Marx often argued against, the English utilitarians, were card-carrying hedonists. They believed that pleasure was the goal of life. Um, whereas the irony of Marxism is that it sees that in order to be able to achieve happiness all round, you have rather gloomily and sometimes rather tragically to forgo it in the short term. Um, you have to pass up on certain short term pleasures and therefore not be a hedonist if you're to achieve happiness politically all round as anyone who sat through a lecture like this or one about the rise and fall of the Asiatic mode of production will be only too painfully aware. 
to that extent, the, the Marxist, the revolutionary, differen differentiates him or herself on the one hand from the hedonist, and on the other hand from the Puritan. Uh, because for the Puritan, happiness or enjoyment isn't, in fact, the final goal of life. Um, for Marx, morality then is a positive and not a negative concept. That's part of what I'm saying. It's not a prohibitionist one, although, of course, positive conceptions of morality have to involve prohibitions. Um, there's no point, as W.H. Auden said, uh, as he said in a nice little rhyme, that what truth is to be got from observing mankind and simply inserting a not. He was talking about the Ten Commandments. Uh, I um, morality isn't about, in the first place, what we ought to do, though it involves those questions, it's about what we want to do. It's about, for the tradition I'm talking of, fulfilling our natures in a pleasurable way, not about sternly repressing them, uh, as Kant believed, on the whole, in the name of some high ideal, for which a single word in English culture might be Protestantism. But, of course, it's also about the fact that we can't do that now and therefore about the material conditions that would be necessary to bring that about. Morality, that kind of moral language, is in a certain sense, in a good rather than a bad sense of the word, utopian. There are good as well as bad senses, of course, of the word utopian. Um, it tries to outline a way we could live in the proper kinds of social and material conditions. It says these are the fundamental values, but not yet. They're not yet possible. Um, that's not to say, on the other hand, that the abstract bourgeois language of rights and duties, the reduction of moral talk to that, is simply something to be opposed. That was a revolutionary discourse in its own day, as Tom Paine and the Jacobins and Mary Shelley and many others were well aware. Uh, that language may not be much in favor in a postmodern age, but it had its progressive side historically. Marx, however, sees in the end that that necessary and sometimes revolutionary language of universal natural rights and duties is too anemic, is too impoverished to capture the wealth of a more positive conception of morality. And what that more positive conception has to do with, as against rights and duties, is actually rather quaint sounding Victorian word today, virtue. Virtue means the kind of social dispositions bred in us that affect the quality and texture of our life in society as a whole, rather than just isolated actions that we can abstract from that life and say, is this action right or wrong? That, for the tradition of virtue, which I'm saying runs all the way from Aristotle to Marx and onwards today, is the wrong way of asking the moral question. The bourgeois moralist says, is this isolated action right or wrong? It's not easy to see that as political. The exponents of the virtue tradition say, how does what I do, or what we do, relate to the concept and possibility of the good life together? And that clearly is more political. What then is it to enjoy yourself for Marx? Well, the phrase, the phrase that Marx uses ad nauseam in his writing, as far as that goes, is, I kind of paraphrase or parody even, the full, free, rich, all-round development of human powers and capacities. That is a slogan that rings through Marx's anthropology from beginning to end, from the Paris manuscripts to an end. Um, that is, I think, more or less what Marx would call morality. To do that is what he would call morality, and that is a materialist conception of the moral in two separate interesting ways. First of all, um, to put the point as provocatively and as misleadingly as I can, Marx understands that to be good you have to be well healed. Does that mean the poor are a morally shabby lot and the rich are a shining example of virtue? It would be a perverse interpreter who would get that out of the work of Marx. No, it means that to be good in that sense of goodness, in the sense of the full flourishing of human powers and capacities, historically bred and conditioned powers, you have to have the developed material conditions in which to do so, because in conditions of exploitation or oppression or scarcity, people's powers and capacities will be stunted and thwarted. Whereas on a more bourgeois notion of morality, 
simply doing what is absolutely right regardless of the circumstances, you can of course be good in the most wretched conditions. On this virtue notion of morality, you need certain material conditions for your individual powers and richness to thrive. The second and more tricky to grasp reason why this is a materialist concept, and I'm sorry I'll have to outline this very crudely and quickly, we can talk about it later, is that what it's doing, I think, although Marx doesn't say this and maybe didn't even quite see it, it's shifting the concept of morality from the superstructure to the base. Um, to use an image wildly popular now throughout the land, about as popular as believing in UFOs or the Loch Ness Monster. Um, why do I say that? Because for a bourgeois conception of morality, morality is really, isn't it, superstructural? It's about, say, legal or religious, uh, other kinds of institution. Marx is actually taking morality, as it were, out of the superstructure and putting it in, in the broader sense, the productive process. Yes, which of course for him, as we know, vitally includes the development of human powers. Men and women are part of the productive forces. For Marx, it's all to do with dynamic realization and development. I'll say something critical about that in just a minute. And that is to say that morality is actually part, in a strange sense, of the infrastructure and not of the superstructure. Well, uh, to say something critical, um, like every um, great idea, the Marxist view of morality as, as the dynamic self-realization of individuals in their material conditions has real problems about it. What hasn't? Um, which powers and capacities to start with? All of them? Are human beings being asked to realize all their powers and capacities? Their capacity to torture, to exploit, to oppress, um, manufacture armaments? Um, uh, and how do, we, and if you say no, no, those are negative capacities, we shouldn't realize them, how and what decides between the more positive and the more negative? Marx can't, quite rightly, turn there to an ahistorical set of criteria. He can't say what decides between those two sets of capacities are absolute laws or the Ten Commandments or God's will. He has to submit that question to the historical process itself. The trouble with that is that historical powers and capacities won't tell you whether they're good or not. They don't come with labels on their faces saying, realize me, or, you know, don't touch me, I'm pretty negative. You have to have some way of deciding. The, if Marx does assume, I'm not saying that I think, that I'm sure he does, I don't know actually, but I think there's some evidence that he does sometimes. If he does assume that all human powers and capacities are inherently positive, then Marx is a good old romantic libertarian with all the problems connected with that. Romanticism works with what you might call the expression-repression model of human behavior. There's something creative in here, and it's struggling to get out and burst through something out there. The problem is that something pretty nasty and negative out there is repressing the creative things in here. I'm caricaturing this, but there's a seed of truth in that. It doesn't matter what you call the nasty things out there which are repressing the things in here. I mean, it could be capitalism or colonialism or Scotland Yard or patriarchy or whatever. All kinds of things. The superego would be another name in a different language. Um, this is a very generous conception of morality and a far too dualistic one. I mean, what it ignores for one thing is, of course, that um, maybe not everything in here is creative to begin with, as I just said. Secondly, more interestingly, that if what was repressing us was simply out there, it would be far easier to fight it. Any power which doesn't persuade individual men and women to internalize it, to take it into their being, which is a name, a name for which is hegemony, in Gramsci's sense, isn't going to work half so well. That model of the creative inside and the repressive outside needs to be, as some people would like to say, deconstructed. So the question is, by what criteria do we decide which powers are creative or not? And I'm saying that Marx has a bit of a hard time in answering that, but he does have a kind of answer to it, which is one that he steals from Hegel. Everybody steals from Hegel. That's what Hegel exists for, to be stolen from. And the solution is a very elegant and interesting solution, not without its problems. It goes something like this. 
imagine this in the form of an imperative to people realize only those of your powers and capacities which allow others to realize theirs fully and freely as well that would mark the difference between a liberal and a communist ethics yes for a liberal ethics each individual free wheels as far as his or her capacities go in a separate space from others for a socialist or a communist ethics um, you have to see individuals as somehow realizing their powers through and in terms of the powers of the freely realized powers of others. That does make a difference and socialism would be whatever set of institutional arrangements allowed that to happen and there are probably a number of them available. It's not actually a perfect answer, by any means, and there are no perfect answers, um, partly because, um, for example, people do seem to have certain quite valuable powers that don't often involve that reciprocal realization through others. They also seem to have quite trivial powers sometimes that do involve that. Those are various kind of technical questions. A more less technical question is that there's something an objection to this ethic of self-realization which is essentially a romantic ethic I don't use the word romantic negatively and which Marx picks up on is that it all sounds a little bit too manly this individual strenuously productively dynamically realizing himself is a him really it's all a bit too frenetic I mean what for example about the moral values of being acted upon rather than of acting what Wordsworth calls wise passiveness or what Keats calls negative capability there are a whole range of creative moral values which patriarchy has associated with the feminine which this rather strenuous ethic rather Promethean ethic tends to cut out even so there's a lot more going for it than the Ten Commandments what this version of morality really says is that being moral is doing what you want being moral is following your desire uh, so instantly we all desperately want to be moral except of course something that some people like to call false desires desires implanted into us by ideology but also even leaving that aside the fact that it's arguable I would certainly want to argue on Freudian if not on Marxist grounds that we are certainly very opaque to, each, to, to ourselves um, often you, I am more transparent to you than I am to myself and that raises a real problem as I said before about sorting out what it is we really desire we need a special language which looks into the matter of what it is we really desire and what will make us happy that traditionally has been called a moral language but when Aristotle in his book The Ethics says there is a language of that kind around um, he goes on to say and its name is politics for Aristotle ethics is a kind of sub-branch of politics you can't really separate them as long as we don't have the socialist and democratic institutions in which we could carry on that dialogue which everybody has to be in on of what it is that we really desire and how we can do it then we won't find out what we really want nothing could be more mistaken than the supposedly socialist or radical notion that we already are in full possession of what we morally and politically want we simply have to break through the enemy and realize it desires that are repressed um, or, or oppressed are therefore not obvious to themselves and it seems to me a disastrously mistaken so-called socialist model to imagine we know exactly what we want our values are in full working order the only problem is that somebody out there is sitting on them if they are sitting on them effectively they will create genuine ambiguity among us about what it is we genuinely desire anyway we need those institutions and we need that kind of dialogue we won't find out what it is we really want just by looking into our hearts which are pretty messy places maybe I should speak for myself there's nothing in the Marxism has no set of fancy 
newfangled ideas to parachute into the historical arena. It's not just a good idea. It's not saying, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we lived this way in some utterly unimaginable kind of world. On the contrary, Marxism has enormous respect for the great bourgeois moral ideals of justice, autonomy, freedom, and so on. No quarrel with those at all. Yes? No fancy new set of values that some intellectual can think up overnight. Um, it simply addresses one question uh, to those ideals with a kind of uh, false naivety. It says, how come that they can never be realized in practice? What is it about the material conditions of bourgeois society which means that every time you try to realize, that, realize those admirable ideas, and we're all behind you in that, they twist by some inexorable logic into their opposite. Freedom becomes oppression, justice becomes injustice, equality becomes inequality, and so on. Marxism has only one moral question to address to address to those ideals and say by what kinds of mechanisms and processes does it come about that you are absolutely incapable of realizing your fine ideals, let alone of universalizing them. You might just about get around to realizing them for minority, even then, because they're only for a minority, those ideals will be distorted and crippled. It's because we take those great revolutionary bourgeois values even more seriously than the bourgeoisie does, that we as you'll be complacently pleased to hear, are the, general, the genuine moralists, and they, God help them, are the moralizers.